Hello everyone and thanks for, for joining this webinar. My name's uh, Ron Daniels, Dr Ron, and I am the founder and chief executive of the national charity, the UK Sepsis Trust. But the important thing to learn is that this is very much a West Midlands based charity. It's got its roots firmly at Good Hope Hospital in Sutton Coalfield. I still live uh, not far away in Solihull and many of our staff are in and around the Birmingham area. And we are reaching people, the public and health professionals, both nationally and internationally. So I'm here to tell you today about sepsis, about how we can safeguard each other, about the scale and importance of the problem, and just give you some tasters other than knowledge and the understanding that you need to be aware of this condition, of other things that we can do together to perhaps save lives on an even larger scale. So I'm going to start by sharing my slides, of course. And hopefully if someone could just give me a verbal confirmation that you can now see that. Yes, yep, that's on the screen. Fantastic. So we're going to talk about sepsis. We're going to talk about what sepsis is, the scale of the problem. We're going to set it in the context of the broader problem of infection and then start to learn what we can do to safeguard each other from it. So sepsis is a life threatening condition. It's actually more deadly than a heart attack and more deadly than a stroke. And it arises when the body's response to an infection causes organ damage. Now, these are really important nuances. Sepsis is not a severe infection. It can arise as a complication of something as simple as a urinary infection or a UTI. But in sepsis, the body's immune system goes into overdrive. It's there to try to protect us, but it overreacts and that causes organ damage. And that's what makes sepsis deadly. And this is not something that's unique to humans. This is across the animal, rather across the mammalian kingdom, the mammal kingdom, that sepsis arises as a complication of infection. Now, of course, many of you will recognise this. This is Villa Park, the home of Aston Villa, who at the time of recording are doing quite well this season. But it gives us some interesting context. Across the UK every year, breast cancer, for example, claims around 11,000 lives. Bowel cancer claims rather more lives, around 16,000 lives lost every year. And of course, it's right and proper that we continue to strive to improve outcomes from those conditions. But sepsis is estimated to claim 48,000 lives every year, which is more lives than are claimed by breast cancer and bowel cancer and prostate cancer put together. Now, it would be disingenuous to leave it there because these conditions can coexist, of course. An example would be somebody who's having chemotherapy for breast cancer, their immune system takes a hit, which we call neutropenia, and they can develop sepsis because of that. Now, of course, if they hadn't had breast cancer, they wouldn't have had chemotherapy, they probably wouldn't have developed sepsis. But we double count these people because the basics of sepsis care are appropriate even for people receiving palliative care for one of those conditions, because we just might get that person home to a valuable few weeks or months with their loved ones. A majority of people who develop sepsis don't have very serious and life limiting underlying conditions. I'm just offering that as an example. Now, in terms of who gets sepsis, some of the best intelligence from this on this comes not from the UK, but from New York State. Now, as a reminder, New York State has a population of around 21 million people, so it's not a small population. And they have the world's best funded, best legislated sepsis improvement program. And they produce some really great data, and this is one example. Now, it is very true that you're more likely to develop sepsis as you age, but of course, that's not the same thing as saying sepsis only affects old people, and these data bear that out. So in 2019, which is the last year for which they've published data, more, sorry, almost half of adults being admitted to New York's hospitals in 2019 were of working age. They were 69 years or less. Similarly, among children, it is very true that the younger the child is, the higher the risk of them developing sepsis with neonates, as in those within 28 days of birth, being at the very highest risk. But that's not the same as saying sepsis only affects very young children. And again, data from New York State help us out here. 
These data show that more than half of children admitted to New York's hospitals in 2019 were school aged children. So that's a lot of data to take in. But the point that I really want to reinforce is that sepsis can affect anyone from a very small baby to an older adult and anyone in between. Now, there are certain risk factors that can make the development of sepsis more likely. Now, they include, but are not restricted to, recent surgery or trauma. So that's sort of obvious, at least to me as a health professional, that if you've got a problem where the skin has been breached, you know, perhaps there's been operations, that it's more likely an infection can get into the body and more likely that sepsis will develop. There's then a bunch of conditions. HIV is an obvious one, but diabetes, perhaps a less obvious one, that make us more prone to developing infection because our immune system isn't quite as normally robust as if we don't have one of those underlying conditions. So if you've got a condition where you're immunosuppressed, such as diabetes, such as you're on chemotherapy, such as HIV, then you're more likely to develop sepsis. And then I'm afraid conditions that make it more likely we're going to interact with healthcare, such as being pregnant or having recently been pregnant, are slightly increasing the risk of developing sepsis. So these are the sort of populations in which we need to have an extra sense of awareness. In terms of the global scale of the problem, and these are data that are supported by the World Health Organization, sepsis claims more lives than cancer. And that might shock some of you, but it's true. I've put COVID-19 in there. Now, I'm an intensive care clinician by background, working at Good Hope Hospital and Heartlands Hospital in the West Midlands. And I am not trying to diminish how horrible the deepest throes of COVID-19 were. They, they were deeply unpleasant for health professionals as well as people affected. But just for context, in the three years running up to February 2023, when John Hopkins University stopped counting direct deaths from COVID, COVID claimed 6.8 million lives during those three years. Sepsis claims 11 million lives every year. So in the three years prior to the pandemic, sepsis would have been expected to claim 33 million lives. COVID claimed 6.8 million during its three years uh, reign of terror. Now, again, I'm not diminishing how horrible COVID-19 was. It's just context. Mass dying from infection is nothing new. And it's these quanta that persuade organisations to take sepsis and antimicrobial resistance very seriously, and the two are intrinsically interrelated. In 2017, we persuaded the World Health Organisation to adopt a resolution on sepsis, and when we did so, we wrote an opinion piece in one of the journals, and we asked the former Chief Medical Officer, Sir Liam Donaldson, to write a forward, and he said, some very important clinical issues, some of them a matter of life and death, exist in a backwater inhabited by professionals and academics and enthusiasts, but the public and political space is where sepsis needs to be in order for things to change. And that's one of the three main functions of our small charity. It's raising public awareness. And of course, whilst the assembled audience is not the general public, this is why we're having this webinar today. It's to raise awareness of sepsis and work out how we can spot it and what we can do about it. Now, we're a small charity. We don't have a large, well, we don't have any marketing budget, let's be honest. So we don't pay for any marketing. The World Health Organization, as I've mentioned, have taken sepsis very seriously, and they um, issued this statement during the deepest throes of the pandemic. You can see that this was issued by Dr. Tedros, their director general, in September of 2020. And he called governments to action, announcing that sepsis is responsible for one in five lives lost worldwide. And more recently in the news, in fact, yesterday, we heard that the government, the health secretary, has announced that Martha's rule is being implemented in 100 of our circa 240 acute trusts. And I was on Sky News with colleagues last night discussing this. And this was about the tragic death of Martha Mills, who was 13 years old, in which doctors didn't listen to her family, which was a very foolish mistake, given that her mother is editor of The Guardian. And since then, Maropi Mills and her husband, Paul, um, obviously 
Martha's parents have been on a crusade to implement Martha's rule across the NHS, and they succeeded in their goal yesterday. So what this is, this is around the right to a second opinion. Now we need to work out how that's going to be resourced because there aren't, as we know, huge numbers of doctors and nurses sitting in hospitals, kicking their heels, waiting to be called. But as long as it is properly resourced, this has the um, uh, potential to save quite significant numbers of lives. Now, so far I've talked about sepsis as a binary thing, that you either survive it or you die, but there is a burden of survival. Now, I'm going to come back to the public awareness side in a, in a few minutes, but the second thing our charity does is we support people affected by sepsis. So we have support nurses who man the telephones, man the emails during office hours, and obviously there's answer phones and, and email response systems to capture those out of hours calls. They provide face-to-face -face support for survivors, peer-to-peer -peer support, so they run support groups as well as introduce people to individuals they can interact with if that's their preference. They provide lots of written and printed material to help people who survive sepsis, um, as well as being there on the end of a phone. We've all heard of long COVID and long COVID is very real, but it was of no surprise to me, having worked in the space of sepsis for many years, that there would be a long tail of recovery from COVID. It might surprise you to learn that most people that we treated in West Midlands hospitals with COVID-19 in intensive care were actually there because of sepsis. This wasn't just people who had low oxygen levels, most of those people could be managed on a ward. A lot of the people in intensive care had multi-organ failure. They were on kidney machines. They needed medicines to support their blood pressure um, because they were going into shock. And that is sepsis. It's the body's overreaction to an infection. This is not just my prejudice. This has been published in the intensive care literature globally. Severe illness with COVID-19 warranting intensive care in most cases was sepsis. But about 40% of sepsis survivors have dysfunction in one or more of these domains persisting at one year after their first illness. So they're physical, which might be extreme and visible, such as loss of limbs or digits, but more commonly it's disabling fatigue or pain problems. Cognitive problems persisting after sepsis are very, very common, which can be fairly minor, sort of minimal short term memory loss, problems with concentrating. Uh, you know, we have people who say to us, I used to be an avid reader of novels and I can't do more than three pages now and I have to go back because I can't remember any of the characters. And then psychological squealing, which again can be relatively mild. Some people describe infrequent panic attacks, but can range up to and include post-traumatic stress disorder. And this was an interesting study from Scandinavia. It was quite small, but it was very well constructed. They looked at all adults who were in full time employment before developing sepsis and providing they were less than 57 years of age because they wanted to follow these people up for a year and exclude people who might be likely to retire naturally anyway. So they followed these 18 to 57 year old adults up for one year and found that one year after their illness, 57% were back at work, although at least a third of those were in part time employment or at a lower level of employment, and 43% were not back at work at all. So sepsis can break people, particularly if it's recognised late, particularly if treatment is started late. And there's a fiscal burden, there's a burden to our economy. Now, we commissioned uh, from the York Health Economics Consortium in 2017 an independent review of the economic burden of sepsis. And they estimated that sepsis costs our NHS in the UK around £2.8 billion every year, but costs our economy £15.6 billion every year because of the costs of rehabilitation, the costs of delayed return to productivity, and of course, the costs of premature death. So the three pillars on which our West Midlands based charity is constructed are these. We support people affected by sepsis, as I've begun to describe. We educate the general public. We, we raise public awareness so that they know what to do if they're worried about someone. And then we empower health professionals to act. And I'm going to describe each of these in a little more detail. So the support services I've touched upon, we have, as I've said, 
online groups, we have face-to-face -face groups, peer-to-peer -peer groups, as well as telephone and email contact. But critically, we provide literature to people. And that's all some of our survivors need, is simply a booklet or some information to remind them that they're not alone and to give them some guidance about how to begin their recovery journey. Importantly, we also support people in the return to work space. So we have advice for um, employers as well as for employees around their rights and duties in terms of return to work. We deal with people who've been bereaved. We actually have support groups for carers, so people who are looking after people who've survived sepsis because they're the often forgotten group, as well as legal advice to help to signpost people to ask questions around whether there was any failing of duty of care. Now, I touched on the public awareness as well, and I, and I started by saying that we don't pay for any advertising, and this includes this stuff. The big messages on our large shouty yellow vans is free of charge to the UK Sepsis Trust. It's actually free of charge to West Midlands Ambulance Service because they are duty bound to livery that panel anyway. So this is a very little discretionary spend by either party and it gets approved messaging out there to the public in a very visible way. Now, we have a symptoms list for people who are worried about a loved one who might be developing sepsis. And we have separate lists for adults and children, which I'm going to show you shortly. These were developed in extensive consultation with Public Health England as was, as well as with the Royal Colleges. And the adults version looks like this. It spells the word sepsis. So what we say to people is if someone you love is deteriorating with symptoms of an infection, you need to look for one of these six signs. Slurred speech or confusion, extreme pain in the muscles or joints, passing no urine, no water in a day. S for severe breathlessness. I for it feels like I'm going to die and people really do say that. And then the last S is for skin that's mottled, discolored or very pale. Any one of those six, and remember the symptoms and the calls to action were approved by the Royal Colleges, the Royal Medical Colleges, that's go straight to A&E. And the public health message now is go to A&E or call 999, cognizant of the demands on our ambulance service. It's often quicker to get yourself there. The symptoms in children are slightly different, but not very much different. Now, I'm not going to read all of these out and, and some of you who are parents will be looking at these and say, well, I don't need this yellow piece of paper to tell me that if my child develops any one of those symptoms, go straight to hospital. But the reality is that illness with a fever in children is incredibly common and there are one million episodes of contact with GPs every single year in England alone with children under five. So we have to be really careful and responsible with our public health messaging. We can't say take your child to A&E if they're not feeling very hungry. So we have to be quite extreme with our calls to action in children in order that we don't overburden a system with the worried well. But then there is a caveat to this, that if you're if you're very worried about your child, if the, your child is not improving as you would expect them to, then go to 111 online or make an appointment to see your GP and just ask, could it be sepsis? And then similarly, we don't pay for large format advertising in city centres. Often spaces in large format digital advertising are unsold and at quiet times of year, so excluding sort of pre-Valentine's Day, pre-Christmas and so forth, often this space is available for donation to charitable organisations. Now, all of our messaging, the Just Ask campaign, which reinforces if a loved one's deteriorating with infection, you need to go to 111 or, or go to see the GP and just ask her to be sepsis. All of this information carries the NHS lozenge for reasons I've already explained. And it's partly for that reason that we're able to access this donated space. We run specific campaigns such as this one, the biggest killer is not the usual suspect, where we make comparisons between sepsis and those other conditions I've already mentioned. And we work with large organisations, and this is but one example, I've got other examples in a little while. And the message to them is not give us your money. The message to them is not spend on a big advertising campaign, it's just use your existing dissemination strategies to get the message out there. And this campaign we ran with Liverpool Football Club is but one example. 
We work with television programmes. This is BBC's Holby City, which is now defunct, but we've worked with Coronation Street, EastEnders, Call the Midwife, Hollyoaks, all sorts of programmes to get sepsis storylines right. And what we now have for our next generation is a schools programme. So we have lesson plans approved for all key stages in school under the PHSE curriculum. And there's around 2000 schools now across the UK delivering these lesson plans. This is funded by Iceland Foods, the frozen food people. It's supported by Hollywood actor Warwick Davis because his wife developed sepsis and narrowly survived. And it's a really important message to get across to the schools uh, to, em to empower our next generation to act. And it also teaches the next generation a responsible attitude to antibiotics and personal hygiene. Now, the reason, part of the reason we're delivering this uh, webinar today is that Birmingham City Council is a sepsis savvy organisation and this is a programme that we run across organisations large and small, really encouraging organisations to do what they can within existing resource, whether it be a lunch and learn, whether it be webinars, whether it's simply messaging in a payslip to get the message out to their staff and their broader community. And that's supported by our own BAFTA award winning actor, Jason Watkins, who tragically lost his daughter, Maud, to sepsis, more on which in a moment. At the very basic level, if we're not able to engage in webinars and this sort of thing, then we have a short electronic game as well as that short video that I just highlighted on screen to watch. That's the sort of minimum ask is disseminate these to your staff and your broader public. So I've touched upon support. I've touched upon raising public awareness, which is really why we're here today. And so I've majored on that a little. But something else that we're very proud of is that a campaign and a clinical strategy that started right here in the West Midlands has now reached penetration in 41 countries around the world. So we empower clinicians to act. We take academic guidance and we translate it into simple clinical tools. We work with organisations like NICE and very recently, only a few weeks ago, NICE updated their guideline on sepsis and NICE said to us, as they were in the final stages of drafting these guideline updates, can you work with us to design the clinical tools? And we, as you can tell, as an organisation are very proud of this privileged position. We're the people that NICE come to to translate their academic guidance. And so I'm not going to go through this because it's frankly, not relevant or interesting to uh, many people who aren't health professionals. But the important point is that we have tools for all age groups across all sectors of healthcare. So we have community care facilities and residential facilities tools. We have dental practice tools. We have ambulance tools, GP tools, hospital tools, the whole gamut of healthcare from birth until old age and including women during or immediately after pregnancy. And essentially, we risk stratify people and we say, if you tick the red flag criteria on the left box to there, then we're going to deliver a set of actions within one hour. If you tick a softer set of criteria there, then you're going to have a more generous window of three hours in which to deliver your interventions. And the intervention that we encourage people to deliver health professionals, this is, is the sepsis six, which again started right here in the West Midlands and is now saving lives around the world. And again, I'm not going to go through the detail, but these are six simple tasks that any health professional can deliver. So although it starts with inform a senior clinician, these are not led by a senior clinician. They're just told what's going on so that the junior health professional can get on to deliver the rest. Now, every junior doctor and an increasing number of junior and middle grade nurses can deliver every element of the sepsis six. And the sepsis six delivery has been shown to double a patient's chance of survival. And I think the simplicity of this clinical tool, together with the empowering nature of this clinical tool, is the reason that it's spread like wildfire around the world. And it's in places as diverse as it's in Vietnam and Cambodia, it's in Germany and Austria, it's in parts of Australia, it's in parts of North America, Canada, it's in use in Bangladesh, in Malawi, in Qatar, in Saudi Arabia. This truly is saving lives around the world. And I think we in the West Midlands have to be have a, a lot of pride to take in that. Now, just to conclude, um, before we open the floor to questions and comments, 
this is about, for us as a small charity based in the West Midlands, this is about amplifying through networking. It's about collaboration. We're not a Cancer Research UK or a British Heart Foundation. We can't come with a couple of million pounds to pay for an advertising programme. We are a small charity. But what we're ingenious at, and I think we're extremely good at collaborative working, is building these networks. So similar to the reason we're here today, the Sepsis Savvy programme, we have formed now partnerships with over 150 organisations and just some examples of them are here. So they range from the huge multinationals like Pfizer and JP Morgan through, uh, and Microsoft, obviously, through to very UK based organisations such as Iceland Foods, who are also in Poland, as well as Lang O'Rourke and Mott McDonald uh, and Warburton's. But a whole gamut of organisations that are doing what they can to raise the word. And the strategy that these organisations take varies hugely. So the National Farmers Union and FU Mutual, for example, have disseminated videos where we interviewed uh, young farmers who had known people who had been affected by sepsis. We, we did a walk around a farmyard to talk about the safety hazards that make people more likely to develop infections. And they, they had a really strategic and targeted campaign to get the message out, particularly to their young farmer audience. And it followed the death of a young farmer called Hannah Brown, who was only in her early 20s. She uh, she used to show award-winning cattle. She was a very enthusiastic and well-loved young farmer. And she sadly died of sepsis because neither she nor her family knew what to look out for. This is the difference we're making. Ice and Foods has been a really good example of what can be done in partnership. And this is really just to get people who are listening to this, as well as knowing what to do, what to look for, the symptoms to look for, to get those juices flowing, to think about what they might be able to do to accentuate this message even more. This might be in a small community group or in a school organisation, or it might be connection with a West Midlands based business. But Iceland Foods have not only educated their staff, they've educated the broader public. And they've done that with multiple strategies. They've made videos, they've run an advertising campaign, they've had messaging in their shops, they've had messaging on their vans, they've paid for the schools programme, Schools Against Sepsis. One of the most ingenious things they did was the milk bottles. Their finance director lost his father to sepsis, sadly, and being a finance director, he didn't really want to spend any money. So in a very similar way to the ambulances, he came up with an idea. He said, we have to print milk bottle labels anyway. By the way, Iceland Foods' three biggest sellers are not frozen. They're milk, bacon and eggs. So he said, milk bottles, we print the labels anyway. So why don't we put some sepsis messaging on them? And so far, they have sold 100 million milk bottles to breakfast tables up and down the country, just raising awareness of the importance of knowing the symptoms of sepsis knowing it's in a medical emergency and knowing that early intervention saves lives. And again, just to get those creative juices flowing, we've got some wonderful buildings in Birmingham that, you know, yes, some of them are a little bit Marmite, such as the library, but they're iconic buildings. And we've worked with um, companies, this is Aviva Insurance's headquarters in Canary Wharf, um, to illuminate the side of buildings with sepsis messaging. It really stops people in their tracks and we have activation teams down on the ground engaging people and informing people that this is what this is all about. This is why this company is involved and we are here to help you to help us to save lives. And that's what it's all about. I would urge you to watch the ITV documentary. It's BAFTA award winning actor Jason Watkins and his wife Clara and they describe their journey of pain, grief, anger, bewilderment, joy and love following the death of their daughter Maud. Please do have a box of tissues handy. It's a short documentary, it's only half an hour, but it's very, very well worth a watch and will, if I haven't managed to, certainly engage you in this drive to save what really, not just not in the West Midlands, but across the UK, gives us opportunity to save thousands more lives every year. 
Thank you very much for listening, and I'm very happy to have a chat and take any questions, comments, or even challenges. Thank you so much, Ron. That was a really helpful, um, really helpful um, awareness um, session there on sepsis. Um, <clears throat> does anybody have any questions or comments? Whilst whilst others are um, getting um, their thoughts together, I just wondered. Um, I really, I really like that. One of the posters you had um, shared about support, educate and empower. And I just wondered um, from the empower perspective, what kind if you could give a little overview, what kind of um, activities that includes like with healthcare professionals and that early detection, if that would be OK? Yeah, of course. So um, it, it's around strategies like the provision of the clinical tools. But of course, alongside that goes a lot of education. So we have e-learning resources that can be accessed individually, or we have large contracts with some acute trusts, not here in the West Midlands at the moment, but we have large contracts for e-learning with those acute trusts so that they can empower their health professionals to act. Another example I can think of is, is Marie Curie, the, the cancer, um, well, it's actually not just cancer, but the hospice organisation, a lot of their clientele are cancer patients. They came to us and said, well, we would really love some sepsis recognition tools and training for our team, for our carers, for our health professionals, for our volunteers. And so we've done that with them. We've created bespoke tools that are appropriate to the hospice as well as the community end of life care setting that really pace, place the patient front and centre. And it goes back to what I said at the beginning. Just because someone's got cancer and is receiving end of life care does not mean that we shouldn't treat them. There will be some people who are naturally approaching the final days of life in whom treatment might not be appropriate. But a majority of people, if they've got an ex a life expectancy measured in weeks or months, it may well be appropriate to treat their infection, to treat their sepsis, to return them to a quality of life they can enjoy. And then a specific example to the West Midlands, we're working with um, children's hospitals, um, but the, the flagship one really we have is Birmingham Children's Hospital. Because children are a risk group for sepsis and because children who've been hospitalised are particularly a risk group or who have underlying health problems being seen in outpatient clinic, we are working with BCH to give parents information leaflets to help mm. them to spot sepsis in their children and that's something that again I think here in the West Midlands we can be rightly proud of so that's just three examples and I hope that sort of illustrates the type of activity we do with health professionals. Yeah no that's really helpful and I think you touched um, you know very quickly on a very important bit there outside of health you know well healthcare professionals and their own right carers you know especially um kind of family members and um yeah. you know kind of in um yeah, from that kind of perspective as well. So being able to engage there and kind of improve improve awareness there because that can be a life changing kind of um, you know opportunity there to kind of um, recognise those mm -hmm. those symptoms earlier. Thank you. That's really helpful. And um, we've got a hand up. Um, is is that Mags? If you'd like to come in there, you're on mute. Sorry. So you, I was I've going to say, are you going to tell her or shall I? <laughs> no, I've had three years to get used to that and I still forget haven't, to take the bottle. Haven't we all? And we all still, <laughs> we all still mess it up. <laughs> so my, my name is Max. I'm a nurse and I'm a clinical educator for a small um, independent healthcare company. We're a, we're a charity. And um, my question is, so first, can I say thank you? I think I bring your name up more times in, in our meetings because we have hospitals and care homes um, in our meetings a lot. So thank you for everything you do with the UK Sepsis Trust. Um, on a personal level, very recently, I had an experience with my mother in regards to neutropenic sepsis, where I saw what you've talked about quite a lot, where there are what I would call quite serious failings still in both primary and secondary care. As a result of that, my, um, my my colleague and friend who works in our local NHS trust, who's the outreach lead, critical care outreach lead, have decided to put on a sepsis awareness day, which we are bringing together. We're involving the ICB because we want to try and get as many health professionals at it as possible. My question is, what would you suggest that we, um, we're hoping to get keynotes and do some workshops, what would you suggest from an education perspective we focus on? Educating healthcare professionals or educating the public? I just want to know what would be the best thing you'd recommend. 
Yeah, well, it's a bit of both, really. I mean, I, I, I always say to get this right as a partnership, you know, we need public who are empowered to access healthcare in the right way and at the right time, who are also empowered to be a little bit assertive if they're faced with someone who isn't taking their concerns very seriously. And Martha's rule is a small part of that as well as empowering health professionals to to act and to think sepsis. And I, I think, and I, I don't know whether you, and by the way, thank you for your kind words and very happy to help out at your awareness session, whatever it turns out to be. Um, but, but I think thank you. health professionals are sometimes a bit disquieted and they're sometimes a bit nervous around giving antibiotics because of this perceived conflict between antimicrobial resistance and sepsis. There's actually really good national data during a period from 2016 to 2019 where NHS England said to hospitals, you've got to get sepsis right, that showed that we prioritise sepsis, we massively improved the rate of delivery of antibiotics, but there was no increase in antibiotic use in hospitals. Mm. So I think the message to those health professionals is this is life threatening. This is a medical emergency. We do empower you to act. And it's about getting this culture where they're thinking sepsis and critically <laughs> listening to families. So my humble yeah. advice, Mags, would, would be get some patience at that meeting. Yes, well, I might actually, uh, I mean, we're hoping to do it as a, quite a big day. I actually, I might get my own mother to speak because, yeah, I Absolutely. mean, the, the reality is that, the, 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 I mean, I'm trying to, I, I believe in, you know, don't blame, learn, educate, change. But um, the reality is had the original pathway been followed that was recommended at her first healthcare contact, she probably would have died based on and I, it sounds very dramatic but that was the reality she was extremely sick so I really do appreciate that and I'll take that on board is there any way I could ever contact you to speak about it separately for any advice or guidance yeah yeah I, so my email's in the public domain so I don't mind sharing it here it's it's simply ron at sepsistrust.org oh that's lovely thank you ron I'll, I'll that, and all. I do appreciate your time thank you very much not at all bye-bye bye-bye Thank you. Thanks, Mags. And um, we've got another hand up. Um, Ida Funke, would you like to come in? Apologies. Yes. Yeah. Pronounce. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. I really want to appreciate everyone, and I appreciate your presentation, Rona. Um, by and large, I just wanted to contribute a bit to what um, the last speaker uh, to the question of the last um uh, the speaker. Uh, from my own experience too, there was an, a, I'm a clinician, sorry, I'm Adi Funke. I'm a clinician with 15 years of experience. I've worked at both clinical access and at, at the management level. Uh, there are some points when I was uh, at the clinical access in Nigeria, we kept on seeing an increase in the mortality rate in the infant's ENC unit. And uh, this is a result of sepsis is the top list of our, uh, the, the root cause. Then what we did uh, is like, it's related to the last speaker's question. Um, you know, the thing is on both sides, just like the way you have answered it, there should be some protocols from the, the, the carers, the facility level, and the outsiders. What we did then is that we tried to put some protocol after creating the awareness, we do the advocacy. We try to, you know, to educate both the healthcare worker as well as the relatives, the relatives of the um or of the client of the patient, likewise the patient themselves, as little as they are. And uh, we try to put some precaution, precaution in terms of the basic IPC, that when you are coming, no matter who you are, no matter how knowledgeable you are, even if you're a doctor, there are protocol for you to follow. So we noticed that immediately we start doing those protocols and we have a checklist to see what have we been doing what have we been doing not at the end of the day we're able to do some assessments and we realize that the kind of you know improvements in the uh in the motor uh, in the risk of the mortality rates and the 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 the, the figure the the, the 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 proportion actually reduces at the end of the day so it's on both sides we need to put some precaution to those people that care, the healthcare, the facility level, as well as the outsiders who may need to come or to say, do something with their relatives in terms of basic IPC measure. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think the, these are really great points. And I think 
you know, if I may, the, the sort of the themes that come out of, you know, the fantastic work you've done in Nigeria are, yes, we absolutely have to listen to families and carers. You know, we, we, we've agreed that that's key. I think any protocol has to be context sensitive. Um, what will work in an urban centre within the UK might not work in a very rural centre in the UK. The, the only experience I have of sepsis improvement in Africa really, apart from some work in South Africa, was in Malawi. And we recognised very early on that with maternal sepsis, the bundles of care that we were delivering in the UK or recommending for delivery in the UK were not applicable in Malawi. So we, we um, developed a unique um, for low to middle in income country settings, a unique bundle of care called the Fast M bundle in Malawi. So it, it's got to be very context sensitive. It's got to be absolutely patient centred. I, I, I completely agree. And, and I think the work you've done is, uh, is fantastic. So thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions from anybody yeah, in the call? If I if, if I can just say something, sorry, uh, Rona, Ron, sorry. Can I have? Can we? Can I chat with you? Can I talk to you? Or if there's any way to join you to do some things as a volunteer? Thank you. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Drop me an email. I'd be very happy. The 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 same email email as before. Ron at sepsistrust.org. Can you can you drop on the chat? Sure. Sorry, are you one of the NHS volunteer um, responder coordinator? Um, I don't fully understand. I'm an intensive care consultant at Good Hope and Heartlands. Um, I sit on the NHS England Acute Deterioration Board centrally, um, but I, yeah, I'm not a coordinator of NHS work. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments from colleagues on the call? I think that is it then. Um, just to say thank you so much again, Ron. It's really helpful and a really informative um, session um, and, and some great discussion there at the end as well. Um, thank you for providing your details. Um, so for anybody who wants to get in touch, please, please do so. Um, and thank you again. Thank you. Take care. Thanks Take for care, the invitation. Ron. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.